One of the benefits of consulting for clients that have a global scale of operations is the travel that comes with the work. Seeing new places, meeting new people, and learning new cultures can be very exciting, even if the travel is mainly for work. Conventions are often held in big cities that are filled with entertainment, and convention hosts specifically choose those locations to create excitement that might raise attendance. I've had the opportunity to visit Las Vegas for multiple clients over the years, and I can truly say that though I've tried very hard, the architectural wonders of the Strip in Las Vegas cannot be captured by a camera. Each massive hotel is like a city in of itself, filled with shopping malls, restaurants, bars, Broadway shows, concerts, and other attractions. From the moment I entered the lobby of any one of the hotels in Las Vegas, I was overwhelmed by the artistic design. I could spend hours just looking at the lobby. From magnificent paintings to finely detailed woodwork, from thousands of carefully placed light bulbs to carpet woven into masterpieces of design, the resort hotels are simply breathtaking. That same careful attention to detail carries on through every aspect of design in every feature of every hotel. The city is filled with entertainment. Visitors to any attraction in the city expect to pay a lot for their entertainment, while the entertainers are expected to draw crowds large enough to fund the unbelievable operating expenses. To thrill-seeking visitors, the city is nothing more than entertainment. But to the entertainers, it is nothing more than a business. If visitors stop paying, there are very few entertainers who would continue their show. I suddenly thought about the similarities to the divine healers, entertaining crowds with their preaching. They also had to be entertaining in their speeches and had to run their operations like a business to offset the huge expenses. Why didn't they hold the prayer lines in hospitals, clearing out the sick wards? If their success rate was as high as advertised, then insurance companies would pay them for the money they save from doctors and expensive operations. The healthcare problem in this country would not even exist. I thought about the cost of holding one of these meetings. From travel to rent to hotels and food, the revival meetings would have been very expensive. Yet the prophet said that he never took an offering. How could he afford to stay in hotels like London's Piccadilly, one of the most expensive in the world? One day, a former message believer shared with me their findings on the tax records for Voice of God recordings, which was the headquarters for the message faith. I was surprised to see that they had accumulated over $100 million in assets. I was even more surprised when the former message believer shared the tax records of a brand new organization that none of us were aware even existed. The year after the $100 million came into Voice of God recordings, Jehovah Jireh Foundation was established, and the large sum of money was transferred to the new organization. I wondered, how many times had that type of financial transaction happened in the past, yet none of us had any idea. The leaders of this organization were brazen, openly stating that the new organization was created for the sole purpose of moving funds. Their documentation read, to provide funding and to support and expand and add to and enrich the services, programs, activities, facilities, and mission of Voice of God recordings. Searching the transcripts of the sermons, I found a time when the prophet was frustrated with the Internal Revenue Service. In a rare glimpse into the finances for his healing campaigns, the prophet described the business side of his ministry. In 1962, he owed over $300,000 in taxes. In today's money, that is almost $2.5 million owed to the United States government. In the 1960s, this would have placed the profit in the tax brackets of the wealthiest Americans, not the poor and humble as he claimed. Anyone earning over $200,000 was taxed at a very high rate, 
Assuming he was taxed at 70%, which was common for the wealthy, this would mean that he earned $428,571.42 that year. And the people of that era were willing to pack out auditoriums to see this genre of entertainment. Like my business associates traveling to Las Vegas, people of the 40s, 50s, and 60s would travel miles to see a revivalist. They had no idea as to the business operating behind the stage persona in any one of the revival campaigns. Unlike Vegas, this was a business without a huge operating overhead. Nor were many people aware of $428,000 that was brought in from the offering plates. In today's money, the profit would have earned over $3.5 million. I quickly got a calculator and started doing the math on his income versus expenses. Even while staying at luxurious hotels like the Piccadilly, paying his host for auditoriums and tent rentals, advertising expenses, and covering the salaries of multiple men, this amount of income was far more than he could spend. I began to wonder, where was all the profit's money going? If the profit had this much income after expenses, I knew that I needed to dig deeper. The more articles describing Roy Davis' involvement with white supremacy groups that I stumbled across, the more I realized that Roy Davis and William Upshaw were securing funds for their Americanization of the United States through the Ku Klux Klan. I found it strange how similar these two men were to the prophet. Their public faces were that of humble, sincere ministers. Yet what was seen on the outside did not resemble what was on the inside. In 1944, both civil and criminal accusations against Roy Davis were stacking up quickly. Some charges were felonies. They included impersonation of a federal officer, illegal weapons, fraud, and mail tampering. Government agents were turning over every stone in their investigation, while news reporters were having a field day with the unusual circumstances behind their investigation. Others working in the Usher Davis Children's Orphanage were charged with grand theft. Finally, Roy Davis, his wife, and others were arrested. Bail was set at $16,000, unusually high for a simple orphanage scam. According to the details that would come out during the trial, the feds knew all about Davis's criminal past. They also knew about Roy Davis and William Upshaw being involved with the Ku Klux Klan. Then, as abruptly as it all started, and matching the same pattern as the early 1900s, charges were suddenly dropped. Roy Davis was somehow able to convince a jury that he knew nothing of the misuse of funds. William D. Upshaw simply disappeared and never seemed to be accused at all. Upshaw was mysteriously absent from most of the reports of the trial. In a turn of events that would shock newspaper reporters, Roy Davis was eventually acquitted and sued the local officials for half a million dollars. In February of 1945, the couple sued for an additional $25,000 for Mrs. Davis. Then, the constant stream of articles in newspapers suddenly stopped. Shortly after the lawsuits, Davis disappeared from California. The next year, William D. Upshaw married trial witness Lily Galloway. In the United States, a wife can refuse to testify against her husband by simply invoking spousal privilege. That same year, the Prophet's Heavenly Vision tour began, and 1945 tracts were published. Shortly after Roy Davis sued Los Angeles officials, in March of 1945, the Prophet had a vision of white-robed people, published it in a tract, and started out in the revival trails. He wrote, this book of testimonies is for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is for that purpose only that I write it. It was in the month of March 1945, one morning at about 3 o'clock a.m., that our Lord Jesus Christ gave me a vision. This he has done many times, and I humbly praise him for it. It continues to read, And the Lord told me to pull back the curtains, and when I did, I saw a great mountain of the bread of life. 
He then said, feed these, and turning around I saw white-robed people, coming from everywhere making up a large audience. The following night, after the vision was over, I explained it to my church, just as the Lord had given it to me. According to the tract, he had already been in a healing ministry until 1940. This seemed to confirm what I had already found in my research. Then, for five years, the prophet's ministry was put on hold, which explained the gap in my research. But in 1945, the prophet claimed to have been given a double portion of the power to heal in 1944. He wrote, Then one year ago, while I was standing in my yard, the Spirit came to me again. I was told that God had forgiven me and that a double portion of the power to heal would be given me. In this book are some of the things that he did on my first trip for him. This version of the stage persona, describing how the prophet's gift came, was vastly different than the version used in later years. I had listened to countless sermons describing an angel meeting the prophet in a cave in 1947. In fact, the cave where that happened was a sacred place for those of us in the message. We never knew that he had a healing ministry before 1947. We never heard the backstory of how the gift of healing came in his yard as he said it in the 1945 tract. Is this why the 1945 tract was so difficult to find? I found an article in the July 1947 issue of the Everyday Magazine in the St. Louis Dispatch. Reverend Kidson of Houston, Texas was managing the Prophet's revival meetings at the time. Kidson also claimed that the gift was given two years prior, which would have been 1945. Only $60 rent was required to collect two large suitcases full of cash. Kitson described the hefty men who carried the money from the meetings. The article read, but first a collection had to be taken to defray the $60 rent for the tent, even though it wasn't being used, and the rent for the gym. So far, the people in Houston, Texas had been the kindest in showing their appreciation, but Brother Kitson had no doubt that the people of Vandalia could outdo them. A man at the hotel later told us that it had taken two husky men to carry in the boxes of offerings from the kind people of Vandalia the night before. As the collection was taken, the audience stood and sang Brother Branham's favorite hymn, All Things Are Possible, Only Believe, and Brother Branham entered. The newspaper reports were very thorough in their investigation, and it was evident that they had not only attended the large meeting, but had also done some research on the prophet before he arrived. Like other faith healers of the era, the prophet claimed to feel vibrations coming from the hand of the sick and afflicted. He even said that it had stopped his watch, explaining getting an expensive Longines watch. Today, those watches sell for thousands of dollars. After feeling the vibrations, he would ask a demon to depart from the person. None in the audience were permitted to watch what went on during the healing. The prophet told the people that if they opened their eyes, the devils would enter their bodies. Newspaper reporters found humor in this statement, having kept their eyes open to report the findings and experienced no demon activity. They wrote, Then he prays for the demon to depart. It is essential that everyone keep his head bowed during the prayer. Should you raise it, the liberated devils may enter your body. During the evening's prayers, heads were kept dutifully bowed, except for those of photographers and reporters, who apparently considered themselves filled with devils beyond redemption and continued their work. It wasn't difficult to see how the pieces of the puzzle were coming together. By comparing the prophet's timeline with the timeline for Roy Davis, I could see that the two timelines aligned perfectly, like zipping a zipper. Still, there was much more work to do and more pieces of the puzzle to find. Where did Roy E. Davis go after he left California? How did he and Upshaw use the money which they had secured in California? How did the prophet use the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he was collecting? Even his expensive jewelry could not account 
for all of this money. It was becoming more and more difficult for me to call him the prophet. He was William Marion Branham, but even that was questionable. His draft card, signed by himself, was submitted as William Marvin Branham. Who was this man that I once respected as a prophet? Could I believe anything that he said? Could I believe anything that anybody said about him? When I approached my grandfather to discuss my initial findings, he was very upset. I will never forget his words to me. People have known these things for years, John. What does it hurt for you to believe it anyhow? Then he proceeded to shun my family from the religion, instantly severing all relationships. If my grandfather knew that there were issues, then who else knew? It was time to dig deeper into his early ministry and the men who helped lift him into fame and fortune. The men who enabled William Branham were no doubt controlling, possibly creating, details for Branham's stage persona. The best place to start was with his alleged first campaign manager, Reverend W.E. Kidson.